Development Update Forum. And uh, tonight we're joined by four panelists and uh, alumnus uh, and trustee Don Wyatt from Middlebury College, who will be moderating our panel discussion. Um, let me also introduce uh, Fibu and Kang, who will be um, our moderator on Thursday if all of our technology works well for us. Um, so, uh, Boone, I see that uh, your Hi. signal is coming in just fine. So, Great to be with you. Um, and we will uh, invite comments from you uh, after the panelists uh, uh, have spoken, and we'll also invite those comments from uh, Professor Wong and from uh, Professor Wyatt. So for the moment, we'll uh, spare you appearing on the giant screen anymore. And Thank you. <laughs> so if I may turn it over to you, Professor Wyatt. Uh, thank you, Warren, and uh, it is a great pleasure for me to return uh, for this particular occasion and to uh, participate in the continuing theme of the wealth and well-being of nations at this 8th Annual Miller Upton Forum. Uh, if uh, Chinese numerology is going to hold true, then uh, it's entirely appropriate that uh, this eighth forum should uh, uh, deal with China. Uh, there's no luckier number in uh, Chinese culture than eight. And as a consequence of that, we expect great things. As Warren has already mentioned, uh, we have uh, for this panel uh, individuals who are going to present for this particular first panel uh, in this year's forum. And uh, my job principally as moderator is to introduce them to you, uh, even though some of them are probably pretty well known, and uh, also to basically keep people moving. Uh, we're not going to, uh, uh, they have their marching orders, so we're going to try and get through things crisply so that uh, we can have commentary from our distinguished guests, uh, including Bi Gun Khan and uh, also uh, Yashan uh, Huang. You've probably seen the panelists listed in various order in the various publicity, but they have, uh, they, they now know the order in which they're going to appear, and I'm going to go through that particular order in that fashion and introduce them en masse at the beginning so that there's minimal uh, sort of um, uh, dead time between their presentations. Sarah Kyle uh, is uh, an alumnus of, uh, alumna of Beloit uh, uh, College. She's uh, a assistant professor in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Michigan. Sarah is a scholar of early modern Chinese literature, pursuing research that approaches texts as material objects and technological innovations. Her current book project, which grows out of her dissertation research at Columbia University, from which she obtained the PhD degree in 2013, examines the variegated uh, production of the unconventional 17th century literatus uh, Li Yu uh, from uh, the perspective of cultural entrepreneurship. Another major project of hers that stems directly from her interest in material culture is a prospective study of the literary career of a single particularly prominent late 16th and early 17th century object that is silver. And she'll be speaking today uh, on the values of cultural entrepreneurship in early Qing China. 
Our remaining three panelists this evening will all be familiar to most of you as contributing members and indeed stalwarts of the Beloit College faculty. Daniel Yude is professor of Chinese language and literature in Beloit's uh, Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. Daniel joined the Beloit College faculty in 2002. And, and holds a PhD in East Asian Studies from Princeton University. His courses uh, focus on Chinese language and literature and Chinese literature and translation. And he's also contributed to such unique Beloit College programs as Cities in Transition through the college's partnership with Henan University. Daniel's outstanding teaching was recognized in 2010 with the James R. Undercoffler Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award, sponsored by the Wisconsin Association of Independent Colleges and Universities <coughs> and the Alliant Energy Foundation. His recent scholarship focuses on the concepts of literary translation and borrowing and the lasting impact of these cultural interactions on the relationship between China and the West. And this evening, uh, Daniel will be speaking on, uh, he's offered a, a paper that's had a few title changes, but this last one is, An Economy of Words, Fictional Narrative, and Entrepreneurship in Early Modern China, Examples for Discussion. Robert Lefleur, uh, professor of the Departments of History and Anthropology, earned his B.A. in Anthropology and History from Carleton College and his M.A. and Ph.D. from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Rob uh, arrived at Beloit in 1998, where his teaching and scholarship focus on East Asian history, but also on the experiential, international, and truly uh, disciplinary, or interdisciplinary. Rob has twice received the Undercoffler Teaching Award in 2001 and 2011, not only because of his teaching excellence, but also because of his well-known enthusiasm about his subjects. Rob has twice been elected to the Faculty Status and Performance Committee at s &P. He's chaired the History as well as uh, Asian Studies programs. He served uh, on seemingly innumerable ad hoc faculty committees. His substantial contributions to the field of Chinese studies have resulted in his receiving the prestigious Millicent McIntosh Fellowship from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Rob this evening will be speaking on Divine Entrepreneurs, Buying and Selling, the Same Thing Over and Over on China's <laughs> Southern Sacred Mountain. <laughs> Jing Jing Lo uh, is associate professor in the Department of Education and Youth Studies. Jing Jing earned her uh, BA degree in Russian language and literature at uh, Be uh, Be Beida, Peking University in China. Her MA in Russian and East European Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and her PhD in History, Philosophy, and Policy Studies of Education at Indiana University. She has published and presented extensively on education in rural China. At Beloit, Jing Jing has taught courses in teacher preparation, education studies, Asian studies, and critical identity studies. Her students praise her passion for her subjects and her thoughtful, caring advising. Jing Jing has chaired the Asian Studies program, served on the Interdisciplinary Studies and Experiential Learning Committees, and participated in the Intercultural Diversity and Inclusion Task Force and the Intercultural Engagement Leadership Circle. Jing Jing this evening will speak on entrepreneurship education at Chinese universities. With this much said on my part, 
I'll try to say as little as possible from here on out. Let us begin. I was told I have an extra 15 seconds to say that 15 years ago when I took my first course on China in this room with Rob and Flora, I had no idea this would ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> you were sitting right there. Um, Situated after an entry on cellophane noodles, and just before that on mutton, in a 1671 collection of essays titled Leisure Notes, is a short essay on pork. The essay opens with a reference to a delectable braised pork belly dish known as Dong Po Pork. This dish takes its name from the famed Song Dynasty statesman and poet Su Shi, who legend has it discovered this preparation method. The essay reads, Dong Po meat is an instance of a man becoming known to posterity through food. If we hear this expression in a rush, it seems as though it's not the flesh of a pig at all, but the very flesh of Su Dong Po. Alas, what offense did Dong Po commit that he would cut his own flesh to fill the bellies of the gluttons of the ages? Several hundred years later, things like cake and cloth were named after the painter Chen Ji Ru. If we compare Megong cake and Megong cloth to Dong Po pork, the former seems superior. But least fortunate of all is that that thing in the outhouse has come to be known as a Megong toilet. Alas, what kind of thing is a toilet that it should be crowned with the name of a distinguished man? It's not that I don't know the taste of meat, but I dare not speak freely on the matter of pork for worry that I might end up succeeding Dong Po. As for that thing in the bathroom, it's not that I haven't come up with a new design for it, but I keep it stored away at home, unwilling to take it out and show it to people or record it in a book for worry that I might become Megong's successor. Nestled between more referential entries, this essay is one of many portions of this book that meditate on the vicissitudes of branding in the booming pre-industrial economy of early Qing China. A creative genius, then as now, wishes to be rendered immortal by his innovations. We do, in fact, still refer to this dish as Dong Po Pork. But one wishes, after all, to become legendary for the right things. I'll be focusing today on the author of this work, the witty and erudite Li Yu, who made a brand of his name and used that brand to market a diverse array of cultural products during the first decades of the Qing dynasty. <coughs> for those of you who haven't taken Rob's class. Uh, he engaged in experimental cultural production at the intersection of the market, aesthetics, and technology in a practice that I want to call cultural entrepreneurship. He combined a tireless pursuit of innovation with the production of easily reproducible designs, and his resulting cultural production presents a compelling model to thinking about entrepreneurship in the pre-industrial world. Shortly after the fall of the Ming Dynasty in 1644, Liu gave up the traditional pursuit of success through the examination system and embarked on a career as a writer of fiction and plays in the urban center of Hangzhou. His short fiction delights in overwrought plot construction and body humor. His plays are raucous and full of farce, and above all, theatrical. Innovation is the defining feature of Liu's literary works, and it's through these stories and plays that he first became famous um, in the new empire. <clears throat> but Liu wasn't content to make a living simply as an author. Over the course of the next 30 years, he constantly sought to diversify and innovate. So in the 1650s, he's publishing about one new short story or short story collection or play each year. But from 1660, he shifted his focus to collections of letters, court cases and regulated verse that, including, that included writing that solicited from hundreds of cultural figures throughout the empire. Near the end of his life, he wrote Leisure Notes, a collection of essays full of designs and suggestions that promised to make readers' everyday lives extraordinary without significant expense. One of these essays teaches readers how to install a pulley system to rig up stage lighting for theatrical performances Another describes a design for retractable eaves for your house that will let you enjoy your garden, whether it's raining or sunny. In genre, subject matter, and tone, Liu pushed the limits of what was acceptable for educated men of his day. 
Distinctions between merchants and literati had become somewhat blurred over the course of the Ming, and some educated men had tried their hands at professional writing, at selling painting and calligraphy, or publishing. With the fall of the Ming, however, urban hubs throughout the Yangtze River Delta experienced major upheaval, and the near total elimination of existing cultural authorities and increased literati mobility generated all kinds of experiments um, by people who are improvising to get by. As they engaged in business they had previously found distasteful, these men practiced strategies of distinction in which reliance on the market was always paired with disdain for the uncultured rich. One artist, for instance, began painting for a living after the transition, but he would refuse to sell to certain people regardless of what they're willing to pay. <clears throat> Liu stands out for his unhesitating embrace of market-driven, or at least market-inspired, cultural production. This stance is most evident in two arenas. First, he didn't limit himself to literary pursuits. He established a print shop next to his home in Nanjing, where he marketed and sold books and stationery. Second, he engaged in other commercial ventures, such as designing gardens and directing a traveling theater troupe that toured to the homes of wealthy men. Yet while Liu stands out among his compatriots for the sheer range of products he developed, he nevertheless maintains and even extends earlier types of social hierarchy, producing and enforcing new modes of consumption. It's hard to get lost in a novel when the narrator is constantly interrupting you, just as it's hard to live in a study with bare walls after you've just read about a new design for crackle glazed wallpaper that will make you feel as if you're living inside of a teapot. In experimenting with the ability of writing and print to transport new kinds of cultural products to a broad reading public, Liu generated, I want to argue, cultural objects that blur the boundaries between production and consumption. So instead of interpolating the, pur the purchaser as a pure consumer, an eater of pork or a user of toilets, many of Liu's cultural products encourage interactivity or personalization demanding, for example, that you stop reading and paper your walls. In this way, he invited consumers to share the burden of the production of culture, even while the final product retains his brand name. This mode of interactive consumption might be painfully familiar to those of us who donate our spare time to the maintenance of Mark Zuckerberg, a unique form of consumption that is barely visible as production without the intervention of projects like Wages for Facebook. For the remainder of my time today, I'll focus on just one of Liu's accomplishments at the intersection of innovation and technological reproducibility. His solution to the problem of how to make a technologically reproducible painting that nevertheless retains something of its uniqueness as a painting. That is, how to make a fan painting that is reproducible, but not just a picture of a fan painting. For a writer or a painter in the pre-industrial patronage system of the early Qing, fame came with incessant demands for new products. Although Liu confessed to never having had much skill at painting, he had certainly given some thought to what it would be like to make a living selling the traces of one's brush. His 1653 play, Ideal Love Matches, depicts a pair of well-known late Ming cultural giants, um, Dong Chi Chang and Chen Ru. The play opens with these two men complaining about the burden of requests for their work. They plan to spend the day in disguise so that potential customers won't approach them. Instead of refusing buyers, however, the painters of Liu's play embrace falsehood in advertising at the end. They each end up marrying a woman who forges their paintings for a living thus doubling the production capacity for their brands. <laughs> but doubling was not a sufficient scale for Liu. He focused on woodblock printing, whose simpler technological reproducibility ensured a larger market with less effort. He reconceptualized print, forging a new path as a designer who made easily reproducible books work in new ways. So connoisseurship manuals had long profited by commodifying knowledge about the proper consumption of luxury goods. 
But Liu's book is full of reproducible designs that make old luxury goods, like paintings, bronzes, and tea, obsolete. In this play, Ideal Love Matches, accomplished artists suffer constantly in their dealings with uncouth customers, even as they profit from them. Liu resolves this inconvenience by providing each reader with a unique Liu fan painting without actually meeting the reader. Instead, he invites the reader to make the painting following the instructions in his book. He suggests that you carve a window shaped like a fan into the wall of the boat, completely seal every other opening to let light just enter through that window. This window will not only entertain you, he writes, but it will also entertain others. Not only does it absorb the entire exterior scene onto the boat, but it also ejects all the people on the boat along with the tables, mats, cups, and plates outside the window for the enjoyment of passers-by. <laughs> so here's an illustration from that text. If you can't see it, the fan window is down here at the bottom. Liu's window offers two fan paintings in one. Those on the boat enjoy a scenic landscape painting. Anyone on the shore sees a painting of a lively party. Even at home, Liu says, one can capture a scene in a similar fashion using old branches, rocks, or birds to create a diorama outside a window. With this fan painting, Liu solves the problem of authenticity, he's the designer, and the problem of labor, you do the work. <laughs> Using the old technologies of writing and print to produce, reproduce, and profit from such designs, many of which he never saw constructed. His essay required your paper and glue to produce an original new fan painting. With designs like this one's marked with his brand name, Liu borrowed readers' labor to commodify their everyday lives as he saw fit. He designed things like chairs or drawers, and even mundane activities like sweeping and walking. This particular combination of innovation and technological reproducibility makes print work in new ways, offering a personalized, tailored, and interactive experience. Liu gained a wider clientele and required less financial support from each client than he would have as a painter or a calligrapher, forming a peculiar hybrid of writing and design. His works could be mechanically reproduced by his servants and widely disseminated at an urban point of sale. But in order for him to profit from this, he needed to find a way to convince readers that he had rights to each copy of his easily reproduced books. Liu's books were pirated as early as the 1650s, but his most interesting statement about his sole right to produce copies of them appears in an essay on stationery. Permission is granted to copy all the new designs in this book except the stationary designs, which I get my servants to manufacture and sell as an alternative to making a living by my brush. These may not be reprinted. Stationary, for which he also offers several novel designs, is the only design in leisure notes that can be easily reproduced on a mass scale. Concerned for his livelihood, Liu declares, as for those who reprint my books in the belief that their wealth and power will protect them, they are living off my labor, and that is a situation that I cannot tolerate. I swear I will fight them to the death, and hereby give notice to the authorities that this book marks a new policy on my part. Heaven and Earth gave each, each one of us a mind, and it's up to each of us to develop our intelligence. I have done nothing to stultify their minds or prevent them from developing their intelligence. What right do they have to take away my livelihood and prevent me from living off my own labor? So here, Liu argues fervently against the unauthorized reproduction of his books and stationery, precisely because he knows that consumers lose absolutely nothing when they purchase a pirated edition of these easily reproducible products. Liu's printed books and his stationery have always been copies, and their popularity and lack of any authentic traces of his brush seem bound to invite further copying. According to Stephen Owen, from the mid tang Literati began to claim that a singular style or a text that memorably represents an experience or a place is a more secure form of ownership than actual possession of that land. Liu has fully embraced this notion, using his unique style and his writing to claim ownership over a broad range of things, not only places he has visited or objects he owns, but things he's never seen, things that belong to every one of his readers. His vociferousness 
regarding his rights to his designs and written works, draws on this literati practice of using language to claim moral and spiritual ownership of land as superior to financial ownership. Because Li Yu, unlike those earlier literati, also depends on the profits from his cultural production to survive, he finds a way to inscribe economic value within this conception of spiritual ownership, insisting that money should be spent only to acquire what is actually valuable, that which is as far as possible from the materiality of the objects in question and their actual owners. You pay for that fan painting after all by giving up your rights to it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming this evening. Uh, it's good to see some of you as I'm on sabbatical. I haven't seen uh, a lot of you in a while, but it's wonderful to be back. I also want to thank uh, Warren for all his work in organizing the, these events, uh, Don for his efforts, too, in moderating our panel, and especially uh, Professor Huang for coming and joining us and sharing over the course of uh, this week, this wonderful learning experience with us and along the way teaching us many things. Uh, I don't have an opportunity to mention him in my paper, but I did go over his scholarship a little bit before writing, and I was deeply inspired by it, in part by, because of its narrative power. And I will be talking about narrative in my paper, so I'll, I'll leave that to you to draw connections. I also just want to make uh, mention of the fact that Kyle and I did not uh, coordinate in advance, but both of us talk about toilets and fans. <laughs> Today, I will address the theme of entrepreneurship in necessarily brief, almost telegraphic examples from a selection of texts from China's early modern period, a span of time which I take to run from circa 1550 to circa 1800. Along the way, I hope to explore with you through a focus on words and stories, some areas of common concern between economics on the one hand and literary and cultural history on the other. In particular, I submit that there is much to be gained by viewing entrepreneurship, whether in Ming and Qing Dynasty China or in the contemporary global economy, as among other things, a narrative activity that is everywhere and always embedded in the value and desire-making function of language. For some of you, the connection between entrepreneurship, or more broadly, economics, and narrative will come as little surprise. Indeed, I suspect many will be familiar with the work of Deirdre McCloskey, who, in a series of well-known articles and books, has written extensively, and to my mind, persuasively, about what we might call the literary structure of economic thinking. Others, such as cognitive linguists George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, followed later by literary critic from cognitive science Mark Turner, go even further, contending that certain basic features of storytelling underlie human under all human understanding. For McCloskey, however, it is enough to suggest that economists are it is enough to suggest that economists are actually not so very different from novelists. As such, whether they are engaged in the disciplined inquiry into the market of for rice or the scarcity of love, and those are her words, they stand the best chance of contributing to the advance of knowledge in their discipline through the regular and sophisticated exercise of their narrative imaginations. By a similar logic, entrepreneurs and those who aspire in that direction, perhaps some of you, would also do well to exert themselves or yourselves in this regard, that is, through the exercise of your imaginative, imaginative uh, narrative imaginations. With that in mind, let us run ourselves through some paces. Much has been written about the burgerlich qualities of Ming and Qing dynasty fiction. In contemporary Chinese scholarship, in fact, it is often referred to as shimin wenxue, that is to say, literature by, for, and about city folk, expressive of their tastes and values, and embedded in those market-oriented modes of production and exchange that were a prominent feature of urban life in early modern China. One thinks here, inevitably, of Jinping Mei, the plum in the golden vase. In preparing for today's panel, I came across the following statistics. Let me share them with you here, 
as they help set the stage for examples to follow. They come from a paper on the monetization of silver in this novel. According to the paper's author, The Plum in the Golden Vase describes no fewer than 456 cash transactions valued at some 180,000 tails of silver over the course of its 100 chapters. So that's more than four cash transactions per chapter. Of these 180,000 tails, roughly 120, or 66.6 .6 of the total, percent of the total, relate to business dealings, most of which involve entrepreneurial risk taking of one kind or another. Now for some perspective on these figures, a 16th century agricultural manual pegs the per annum wages for a farm laborer at 13 tails. This much is clear. As a comprehensive representation of economic life, the plum in the golden vase, Brooks comparison with no other work of its time, its only real rival in this regard being the considerably later Hong Lo or Dream of the Red Chamber, to which I will return below. Right now, however, I would like to look beyond the plum in the golden vase to a rather obscure early Qing short story collection called Zhao Shi Bei, meaning the world reflecting cup. Now some of you who speak Chinese will have a copy of the Chinese text and you can read along as I read through it. The short story collection dates to about the 1660s, so uh, exactly the same time as Li Yu was living and writing. Here, in a story entitled by excavating new cesspits, a, a cesspits, a skin flint becomes a money bags. We encounter one of the re more remarkable accounts of entrepreneurial resourcefulness in the corpus of Ming Qing vernacular literature. A tale of intergenerational domestic discord, the specifics of which need not concern us here, the story begins with an account of a villager's rise in fortune. To summarize, by converting several rooms of his house into a public cesspit and then selling the collected filth to his neighbors as night soil, Elder Mu, for such is the character's name, devises a scheme, a system as he calls it, a zhidu, to, that's his word, for extracting profit from, and I can put it no more politely, shit, <laughs> to entice people to use his facilities. He has decorated them with pretty pictures and calligraphic scrolls. He also offers the luxury of free toilet paper. In the following excerpt, the narrative reaches a climactic moment, and that you can read along. I'll read in my English tra translation. Lo and behold, they came, young and old, to admire the new cesspits. These are the villagers. Those bumpkins, moreover, like nothing better than to think they might be getting something for nothing. Thus, when they saw that there was free toilet paper to be had, they could barely contain themselves, especially since they had only ever before wiped down there with straw and bits of tile. Now, I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> then, they saw the pretty wall decoration. What wasn't to be loved? A visit to the new cesspit was like taking in a vision of natu natural beauty. Next came the women with their disheveled hair and big feet, their country women. Do you have a women's cesspit, they ask? So Elder Mu, Mu built a new room and dug a new pit exclusively for their convenience and pleasure. Who knew women visitors would outnumber the men? After this, it wasn't long before farmers were at his door to buy night soil. For every bucket, he charged a single copper coin. There were, moreover, those who brought firewood, rice, and oil to exchange with him. Thus, by opening these cesspits, Elder Mu and his family became quite well off. The appropriate aesthetic, <laughs> thank you, because the appropriate aesthetic response to this passage is, I believe, a feeling of qi, that is, with all the panoply of its meaning, from marvelous to original, or how strange, or even that's not right. <laughs> um, the opposite, see, that can be the opposite of jung, which is proper, or what is appropriately in place. Let me explain. First, the story of Elder Mu's cesspit is qi as a literary artifact. For nothing, uh, from nothing, the author has accomplished the marvelous, the creation of something, something not only to be read and enjoyed, as we just communally have, but also something to be printed, bought, and sold. The author is, in other words, an entrepreneur, 
trading in originality and filling the demand of his audience for unusual tales. Second, the cesspits and even Elder Mu himself are a bit qi in the sense that they are, it must be admitted, decidedly strange. Indeed, through association with the abject, filth, what anthropologist Mary Douglas famously has termed matter out of place, they present us with an unnerving spectacle, accentuated by the appearance of unruly women, of all things, from which we readers are protected through the workings of par parody. Finally, Elder Mu's system, his jirdu, is qi, again, in the sense of marvelous and original. <coughs> Analogous to the text as artifact, it creates something from nothing, and it does so, like the text itself, through language. What others call shit, Elder Mu calls pres pres precious sludge, balbei. Um, balbei is, of course, a term used for treasured object or possession. So I ask, does Elder Mu's story lay bare a basic structure of entrepreneurial narrative? <laughs> One man's trash is another man's treasure, as the saying goes, but that is not enough, you see. To get rich, Elder Mu cannot just collect other people's waste for his own enjoyment. He must represent it to them anew. He must tell them a different story about it. Yes, shit is shit, but as fertilizer, it is new life a commodity of real value and a source of wealth, not only for Elder Mu, but for his customers, too. Of course, there is something a bit too utopian about this scenario. What happens when new narrative, at the same time that it creates new value, destroys something of existing value? I suppose what I'm asking us to think about is the ethics of creative destruction, an entrepreneurial notion, if there ever was one. To do this, let us jump from the 17th to the 18th century and consider a well-known, indeed beloved, episode from Cao Xueqin's masterpiece, The Dream of the Red Chamber. Many of you will know this example, especially from last semester. In chapter 31 of the novel, Jia Baoyu, the young male prota protagonist, is embroiled in a conflict between his two maids, Xi Ren and Xing Wen. The proximate cause of the drama is a fan which Xingwen accidentally damaged by treading on. As the fight escalates, Bao Yu, in a fit of pique, threatens to dismiss Xingwen from his service, service, a decision that he soon regrets. To mollify Xingwen's wounded feelings, he then invites her, in a typically flamboy flamboyant gesture, to rip as many fans as she likes. She agrees gleefully, claiming that she loves the sound fans make as they are torn. Another maid intrudes and chides them both, for their wastefulness, and the episode concludes. At first sight, you might wonder, from shit to fans, there's a joke there, as the, uh, as the argue, has the argument of this talk somehow gone off the tracks? Are we still talking about entrepreneurship in China? For me, the answer is emphatically yes. Cao Xueqin was a genius. He creates in his novel a secluded garden of romance and refinement, seduces his readers with the vision of a world of complete surfeit, and then, with compassionate tenacity, undertakes at all turns to undermine this finest of illusions. In response to the dream of the Red Chamber, the great scholar Wang Wei once wrote, with what one imagines must have been a world-weary sigh, what is the essence of life, desire, and nothing more? To which he adds, desire by their, desires by their nature are boundless, and yet they all derive from scarcity. It is tempting to read this comment as a statement on the philosophical or religious meaning of the novel. At the same time, it is just as easy to read it as an economic axiom. Uh, recall Deirdre McCloskey's assertion that economic thinking may be applied to the scarcity of love just as easily as to the details of rice markets. Cao Xueqin merely works in the opposite direction, em embedding the loves and desires of his characters in a meticulously observed economic context. Where, we might ask, do all of these fans come from? If we had more time, I could demonstrate to you the 
how the list of items that Bao Yu's older cousin, Xue Pan, brings back to Beijing from Suzhou in chapter 67, including fans, corresponds exactly to the items available in Suzhou shops as they are depicted on a scroll painting commissioned by the Tianlong Emperor to commemorate his southern tour in the empire of the empire in 1751. I'm speeding up a little bit. Um, <laughs> that's when Cao Xueqin was precisely writing the dream. But that will have to wait for another day. Um, on, another day, on another day, we might also take up the little speech that Bao Yu delivers to justify tearing up the fans in which he invokes the Menchian concept of the appropriate care of things, I, which, ultimately, which is ultimately a bit of juvenile sophistry typical of this self-indulgent yet of course lovable teenager, but nevertheless reminds us that there is an important ethical context for acts of wealth destruction and creation in early modern China of which Cao Xueqin was keenly aware. Note the ominous pun of shan, fan, with shan, moral good. Does, do Bao Yu and Qing Wen destroy the moral good when they destroy the fans? That's the question I've decided, as my time is running out, to leave you with. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I want to uh, start by saying uh, thank you as well to um, to Warren Palmer and and, and, and to, to the economics department here and to everyone else who's participated in this panel. I, it's really already been a real pleasure to hear these things, to talk at dinner, and um, it, it's, it's, it's a very special event. This is one of the things, events like this are, are what make me very, very happy about Beloit College. It is a place where, where, where we learn from each other and we, um, and, and we have uh, uh, lots of interesting twists and turns in the story. Uh, um, I have been studying the ch five sacred mountains of China, the Wuyue and Mingshan, as they're often called, uh, for the last um, uh, seven years or so. Uh, um, and, uh, and I started off there with a, an intent to study the uh, rock carvings of, of the mountain, the, the Shurka, all through the mountain. The, uh, the eastern mountain has over a thousand of these carvings and I would stop and I would analyze them and I, I would write about them and teach about them. But something kept bothering me, especially on the southern mountain, where I've been doing a lot of my work uh, 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 um, recently in Hunan province. And, um, and, and again, there I studied the, the rock carvings. I took the long way up the path. I would spend a lot of time doing a kind of modified ethnographic question that I call the thousand ask question. Some of my students have heard of this. It's meant to sound vaguely Chinese, but it's not. Okay. Um, and so I would ask many, many times, over and over, why, why do you take the bus? Why do you not take the path? On and on and on it goes. And, and so I've been asking these questions for a long time. And so my work was really centered on the world of the mountain. Um, a couple of the theorists I teach, one among the theorists I teach in my social and cultural theory class, which meets in here at 8 o'clock in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays, some of you know. Uh, um, um, I have been uh, teaching for a long time the, the French uh, theorist Pierre Bourdieu and his idea of habitus, these inscribed kind of etched patterns of movement that, um, that, that happen, that we do sometimes unconsciously without any outward strategy. And I would just chanced upon another author, and I want to talk about him briefly today, Howard Becker, who is a, a sensation in France today, and his book Art Worlds, but other books, if What About Mozart, What About Murder, uh, um, which is a book, uh, the, the, the subtitle is the most uh, useful here, Reasoning from Cases, and a book, Tricks of the Trade, about social analysis. And, um, and especially in his book, Art Worlds, Howard Becker, who I've been in correspondence with, actually, about the mountain uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, um, uh, Howard Becker has said that, 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 that we start from the wrong position in most of the social sciences by trying to find a few key variables, and then, as the joke sometimes goes when, 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 when talking about research design in the social sciences, everything else stays constant. Okay. And he's saying, you know, nothing ever stays constant. And so he actually proposes a very different approach to, to this kind of analysis. He says, you've got to look at the world of the problem. So here I am trying to understand the world of the mountains. And I took him seriously. And actually, in, in one email he sent me this summer, he said, trying to understand the world of the southern sacred mountain, uh, that's not going to be easy. 
but it is your job. And so I set to work and, and trying to, to piece this together. And when he says, if you do this, if you really go and spread it widely and start to look at all the different things that make up this almost machine, that, that, that you'll start to have different, different variables will pop up. When you finish and you start to get down to the key ones, some of them will be a little bit different from where you would have started otherwise. So Becker has all this laid out, and I've, I've actually taken it very seriously. And, and, and so what I want to do is actually, um, I'll give you one example of what, what um, uh, has often been criticized as a kind of poor methodology. And I was just taught this the other day in my history um, methods class. And, uh, and, and it, it's, it's the author mentions William McNeil, the great, the great writer of grand history, as well as really micro history. And he said he was supposed to give a, um, a, a talk to a bunch of, of, um, of people in the so-called hard sciences. And he said, well, here's how I work. I have a kind of a problem in my mind. Like, how do we make sense of the Southern Sacred Mind, is what I would say. But he said, I have a kind of a problem in my mind. So I kind of frame it, and then I read. And then from reading, I reframe the problem. And then I go and read some more, and then I reframe the problem again, and I read some more, and then I keep reframing until it sounds about right, and then I write it off and send it to the publisher. And the puffy room was like, that's not a method. Where are your variables? Dependent, independent, where are your, you know, well, that's not a method. And so the room was erupting in a mild form of disagreement there. And apparently one physicist in the back of the room said, no. That's exactly how we work. And he was talking about the kind of Kuhnian paradigm shifts that happen if you start to think and, and piece things back. So what Becker is saying is start to notice what's going on. Notice the world around you. And here's what happened to me. I started noticing the commerce that I wasn't noticing before. I was starting to notice that the mountain is just filled with economic activity, including pulling the garbage down. Okay? In other words, it's just filled with that activity. And so what I want to do here is just race you through a couple images. I've been studying the various mountains for 500 days. I spent 500 days or more on these mountains in the last seven years. So almost any chance I get to China, there I am on the mountain, talking to the monks, talking to travelers, and on other things, and, and, and reading anything I can. So I'm just going to take a very rapid run through here. Uh, um, uh, um, um, through some images of the world of the mountain. And then I'm going to talk about some questions it raises for entrepreneurship. Okay, so we have the, I, I'm not going to even try to enlarge these like I was doing earlier for my classes, but this kind of story here, I know this is terribly small. The first 15 images are, are off the internet because I wasn't taking, I was not noticing the wide, the wide world of all of this, and I don't have a lot of pictures of the commerce taking place. Okay, everyone is going there to two key temples, and they are, they are, they're, they're doing basic divinatory practices and throwing things into the burners. That's kind of the basics at the bottom and at the top, uh, at least in those two temples, and as I like to call the divinatory economics, or the microeconomics of sacrality, as I like to call it, is, is all based on there's too many temples, and you never have enough incense. Okay? I mean, you, you don't even need the first day of Econ 199 for that. Okay? Okay? It's a basic problem on the mountain. Way too many temples, not enough incense. You got your bag, you can buy as much as you want, you're never going to have enough for every song tzu, yang yang, you know, every, 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 every sending, sending children auntie uh, section all the way up the mountain. Okay? And so, so there's no, no, you can have all the long to xiang, you can have all the, the dragon head incense you want at, at 15 bucks a pop, okay? Uh, 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 and it's still going to, and, and you're never going to have enough. So to understand this world, you have to understand what's being sold, and I didn't notice enough of this. So the bad pictures are, Rob wasn't taking pictures, he was taking pictures of nature and writing, okay? And was missing the world of the mountain, Howard Becker's point. Okay, so I'm going to take you through just so very quickly, that kind of store, Imagine hundreds of these stores selling exactly the same thing all over for the same price all over town. And as you go up the mountain, fewer of them, and you know what? Basic principle, again, you don't need an Econ 199 for this. Basic principle, it starts to cost more. Okay? Real, it's not that hard to figure out. Okay, so, so, so moving here, uh, I'm through, through just some images because I don't have much time. I'm just going to move quickly through images of what's for sale all over town, and that's the, that, that, this is where you're heading. You're heading there at the base temple to burn your insects, okay? Sometimes it's so extreme you need fire hoses, 
Okay, and, um, and, um, and I'll, I even have a fire hose picture there. Okay, I even have a fire hose picture. They got they, sometimes they just have it gets too hot. Okay, uh, uh, um, Daniel's uh, author didn't have that problem. Okay, uh, 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 okay, and then, and then here's the payload. This is the this is the, the basic the basic move. Okay, so uh, now no, what I'm going to do is now these are my pictures. They're not meant to be great art. I use photos as a mnemonic. I have 40,000 of them of the mountains. They're a mnemonic for my writing, so do not expect great photography here. But you'll see some images of the mountain, the carving, the various things for sale, lists of donors. Okay, temples have lists of donors, and these things, the longevity altars, which were built for this kind of practice on a more personal scale. I have seen them used for almost everything else, including amorous retreats that I just backed away from and walked the other way, a kind of cosmic air hockey played with sticks and, um, and, and stones, and almost, and, and actually for entrepreneurial setups here, this person who, who owns this, this, she doesn't own this, but has set this up as hers, and it has hanging scrolls and orange drinks and all kinds of things set up on the longevity altar. Okay, so longevity altars. Moving quickly through the rest of the mountain, uh, the, you have the top, top, top temple, I thought she was smoking. She's carrying incense sticks. <laughs> uh, all through the town, all through, all the way down the street, all the way down the street, tens and tens and tens of stores selling this, selling exactly the same thing at exactly the same price, selling the same thing over and over. You're, you, you probably can guess what my key question is going to be at the end here. Okay, all the way up the mountain, you start to see the shops. I'm just going to move very quickly through the rest, just to give us some flavor of the mountain world. Okay, of what's going on. And the, the mix of commercial activities, longevity, okay, um, I, I, um, um, and the like. And what are they doing? Look, look at their bags, number one. Look at their bags, man. <laughs> and again, but what are they doing? It's a different thing. I call it, again, tactile religiosity. There's a thing about touching that has a lot to do with religious expression, whether it's rosary beads or more, 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 <laughs> you know, um, right here. But no, look at their bags. Look at their bags. Okay, look at their bags. This is a, this is a, just a bustling commercial enterprise uh, in all kinds of ways. Notice the bags as well as the rubbing. Okay, then, uh, if we want green incense. Look, okay, green incense on on, 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 on. Okay, okay, and then this whole area of the longevity cauldron, as it's called, is actually becomes this vibrant nighttime center of dinner and, and, and bustling activity and things for sale. Okay, and then moving very quickly through the world of the mountain. Uh, um, you can ring the bell for, for money. Uh, uh, oh, and then the, the, you can buy uh, car, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, carriers if you wish. Um, I always pat my stomach and say no. Uh, uh, um, and, um, and, uh, 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 and then you got to hold the garbage down. And then the other thing is you've got all the sites that are near it. So, so in other words, you have to consider the things that are around the mountain if we're going to take Becker seriously. So one of the things you do is we've got the water curtain cave tourism here, because that's where the Journey to the West original Dian Shiju, the original TV series, was, was filmed. So that becomes a site. And you know what the biggest site of all that I never would have figured in the variables of why people come and buy things on the Southern Sacred Mountain? Shaoshan. Mao's birthplace. About an hour away, almost everyone asks me the question constantly. Here we are on this beautiful mountain, thinking about the mountain, and they're saying, have you been to Shaoshan? You know, have you been to Mount's birthplace? And so, so that actually plays into the domestic tourism networking that goes into this, in, in, into what's happening here. So I give you a sense of the world of the mountains. Uh, in, in the larger paper that I'm writing, I'm going to deal with a lot of other issues. Those of you who are a little bit interested in this have already published one thing on this, of raising some of the key questions. I'm happy to give a PDF of this for anyone who's interested, uh, of, of a piece that actually walks through some of the key issues, what I call, what I call religiosity in between. You know, uh, uh, um, and, um, but what I want to do is raise a couple of questions. If you, you just saw just a flurry of activity, but in the last couple of minutes, what I want to do is think about What's entrepreneurship in this context? If you open the 151st store selling exactly the same thing and selling it at exactly the same price on a street, is that entrepreneurship? Or what is it? What do we call it? It's something because it's happening all the time. But what do we call it? I, but if you open a little shop or a little longevity altar, and actually I'll, I'll just pull to, to another image here just for the fun of it. Um, um, toward the end here, um, payload, uh, and then we have the Monkey King. So, so you know, every week we have the Monkey King getting drunk on, on the side here. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, 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 the, but the idea here is, is, what do we call it? What if someone, as someone I know, did at one of those longevity altars, 
opens up a place and, and, and it makes the argument that the temple up ahead, about 100 meters up the climb, has a really great, again, a little great section for children, for, for, for sons, you know, for, for sending children. I mean, for, 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 for praying for children. I'm going to sell you the insects here much cheaper than they will up the temple. Because I know you're out. I know you're out. You're tapped out because you've been going up the hill, and there's too many places to go. And I'm going to sell it for a little less. Is that entrepreneurship? Sounds closer to me. So in this context, what is entrepreneurship? How do we think about it? How do we think of the tour guides who set up on their own as opposed to the organized groups as entrepreneurs? How do we think of, of the person who sets up within the temple, brings a bunch of fish, and then says it's the kind of saving life pond, you know, the granting life. There's a, there's, there's, there's a, there's a kind of concept within the temple. Do you have to clear it with the temple, or can you kind of do it on your own? Okay? How does entrepreneurship works, work, work when there's the same basic move is, is happening? The reason you go to the temple is the, the temples, and, and you, you do the, the incense, you buy these things, is to go to the big burners, like you saw. That's the key at part of the activity. And how does entrepreneurship work within this? And the, what I'm finding out is that there is a kind of risk-taking in some of these operations. I would even say, and I'll finish with this, is that it might be a fairly significant risk to open the 151st or the 300th shop on your street selling exactly the same thing. Thank you. about old things from my colleagues every day. And today is uh, one of those days. In this interdisciplinary panel, we've heard about entrepreneurship definition from the perspective of literature and anthropology. And uh, now I'm going to review uh, uh, how the Chinese government has been putting a lot of, lot of efforts to promote the development of entrepreneurship education in the past two decades. Too bad I forgot my dragon head incense back home. I only have some numbers and back to offer. So here we go. So 1947, uh, this is the beginning of entrepreneurship education. Uh, mostly it's at Harvard. Um, some MBA classes there started some initiative uh, later and was defined at the beginning of entrepreneurship education. In, 1980, uh, in 1989, UNESCO uh, officially recognized the importance and value of entrepreneurial education. And they urge uh, all higher education institutions uh, in the whole world to try to develop it, especially in the level of colleges and universities. Uh, so entrepreneurial education, and here in the notes, I'm just going to use EE, uh, is seen as activities aiming to improve the comprehensive quality of college students, enhance their ability to adapt to the society, to cultivate the entrepreneurial spirit, and enhance students' entrepreneurial skills. So uh, this is just one of the working definition. As you can see, there's an emphasis on the cultivation of entrepreneurial spirit and awareness. And there's also delivery of concrete skills of how to do things. And most specifically, it's a capacity building approach, focusing on overall quality improvement of students. Uh, in China, however, entrepreneurship education did not start until late 1990s. And here's why. Uh, suddenly, Chinese government decided we need to develop this. So there's a long-term goal for sure. Uh, there there's needs to further develop in the economy, especially it has to be sustainable. Uh, so knowledge economy, that's a term uh, dubbed by uh, previous president Jiang Zemin back in 1998. Uh, it, it urges a university to further their reform, to provide more and better human capital, uh, entrepreneurship education. Uh, was also developed under such uh, uh, circumstances. And there's, of course, there's also a much pressing uh, goal uh, or task uh, to solve. That is our unemployment crisis that has been happening the past uh, decade also, actually a little bit over a decade. Uh, actually, that is a, a good crisis in a way. 
the reason why we have a, a youth employment crisis is because there are too many, well, at least there are many more college graduates in the market. <coughs> so uh, there is substantial, actually dramatic expansion of higher edu high education skills since the year of 1998. Uh, early 1990s, there is only about 4% uh, enrollment rate of college students. That's among the age group of uh, aging 18 to 22. Uh, in 1998, the year when we began the expansion, uh, the enrollment rate was about 10%. In 2002, three years later, uh, the rate was 15%. And that is pretty, uh, a significant mark because 15% signified China has entered from so-called elite, um, uh, mass educa elite education to mass education. So no longer there were only a head of people got educated in higher education institutions, but much more students uh, uh, in, um, got uh, more and better education. And right now, uh, up to last year, 2014, uh, the enrollment rate was uh, 38%. Uh, and it will soon reach 40% in, in five years. So you can see, suddenly there are so many more graduate students in the market. And naturally, there's uh, un unemployment uh, problems. You can see some of the figures here. So uh, over the year, there are more and more students graduate without securing a job right away. Uh, and that is why the government uh, started to think about how we should solve this issue. And to bring out education uh, became one of the possible solutions. Uh, in 1997, uh, the milestone, like when we talk about entrepreneurship education and like how it began, it's from Tsinghua University, China's MIT. So they started a campus competition, student business planning competition. It's modeled right after the MIT's one. Uh, if you're interested in knowing about details, I can spell out later in the discussion. Uh, but what happens, it's tremendously successful. Uh, and MOE, MO, MO, English Education, decided we should do it uh, in a national uh, uh, capacity. So starting from 1999, uh, this competition became a national event. And it has been held every two years since then attracted lots of students, and there's a fabulous idea of business plans coming out of it. Uh, and next stage, now we have this competition, but what we do inside the university, other than that, in 2002, um, MOE decided to pilot a uh, different kind of entrepreneurship education in nine institutions, all good ones, mostly in Beijing, some of them in Northwest and Central China, and also in Shanghai. So uh, each university adopted one of the three models, um, as uh, up there. The first one is a classroom-based model, uh, as you can probably tell from the term. So most of the entrepreneurship education took place in education, like by lectures, uh, so there's a lot of um, uh, lectures going on. Certainly there's also some extra curriculum, but that's uh, re relatively limited, mostly like internship, visits to the, some of the companies, and there's outside speakers, etc. Uh, Renmin University, People's University, is the one that adopted this model. The second one is a practice-oriented model. Uh, again, uh, opposite to the other one, the focus is on practice. But it also started from classroom. In some of the classes, students develop or, or, or was invited to develop uh, business plans. And some of them were really great. So they were put into business incubator. Uh, the university usually have uh, consulting services for these students. And they also have uh, startup funding for them. Uh, they also receive uh, subsidies or like uh, wage waiting of some of the fees when they have their office like in some of the university buildings. And uh, they have uh, up to three years for this startup to keep going. And after that, they will be moved into the university science park or more real world. And they are on their own uh, to see if they really survive the market or not. Uh, so, so the Beijing Aerospace University is the one that adopted that model. The third one is a hybrid model adopted by Shanghai Jiaotong University. So they have emphasis both on the classroom training and also the practical aspect. Uh, so students receive training in the classroom, but they also have uh, like funding to start, uh, the university support in, like, in other ways such as uh, consultation, etc. Um, and so each have a focus of kind of like similar, but, but they also have slight difference in the way that they do uh, entrepreneurship education. Uh, the next step, 2005, so what happened this year? Uh, we already have MOE, and uh, he had, it had a lot of pilot projects, and when we university joined this, and this time we have a new player. This is International Labor Organization. Uh, they have this Know About Business. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of like a set of uh, curriculum, 
introducing entrepreneurship education to students, like all the basics. So they piloted in um, China in 2005 in six universities. And by the time, uh, by the end of 2009, it has already reached 20,000 college students through these online courses, uh, the basics about entrepreneurship um, uh, for college students. So this is really a great um, example of collaboration between government, higher education institution, and other organizations from outside. So since 2008, we've seen a couple of models and uh, initiatives. Starting from uh, 2008, that's when things like really sped up. Uh, now we have more players, government, universities, other organizations. So they all come together uh, and they form an advisory committee to guide higher education institutions about how to do entrepreneurship education. Um, and they also have uh, government basically sending this information to all levels of uh, government saying like you should all be engaged. Now this game, everybody needs to be in. Um, and lastly, 2014, last year, actually last December, uh, Ministry of Education uh, just sent a policy document to all universities saying you have to have entrepreneurship education, be it a course or something, but it has to be some credit uh, a student can take. I just talked to a visitor from Fudan University uh, yesterday. Uh, they received the uh, notice around the same time. Actually, they already planned out all the coursework for next year, but they have to make room for this one credit entrepreneurship education class for all students to take, including foreign language school. Um, so by the end of 2013, over 3 million students uh, already participated. So with so many years of effort, so many students involving, so what really happened? Like, how about these young people when they graduate? What do they do? Do they actually start a business? Um, according to a few uh, surveys, mostly in Beijing and Shanghai, but also they did survey on institutions in other provinces. What we found is a mixed picture. Um, so firstly, by the end of 2008, um, there is only less than 1% of students, college graduates, actually started uh, like doing startup business. Uh, that's about like a dozen from each university if you have like three, four thousand graduates each year compared to 20 to 30 percent if we are thinking about number here. That's like great difference. And if you look at the business plan competition, which has been quite successful for years, uh, and then you look at the number of students actually start to uh, like venture into the field, uh, start their own business, uh, again, it's very low percentage. Uh, ten, 90% of them never really tried. And in, in the end, like counting on those really did try, 2-3% two, two, of them succeeded. Or meaning like they actually started doing that. But if they survived, like after a few years, um, that's not counting, so we don't really know. Um, that's why Ma Yun, the CEO of Alibaba in 2008, in one of his public talk, he said like, I don't encourage college students to do, to do entrepreneurship, like, to start their own business, because it's still a pretty tough field. Um, but there are some positive numbers, as you can see, over the years, especially the past few years. Um, there is some increase, 2.3% 2, 3 .3 in 2013. Still pretty small, but it doubled, right, uh, compared to the one in 2008. And after half a year, 40% uh, of them are still trying. Uh, another thing I want, you, I want to point out is many of the, of the students they did not start their own business right after graduation, but they worked for a few years. Then they start. Uh, that's actually when they have more success rate. So who are these people? <coughs> if we look at all the entrepreneurs in China, most of them are young people, aging between 18 uh, to 34. Um, and only over a third of them having a college degree. Uh, the majority of entrepreneurs in China actually doesn't have like as high education. Um, and there are very few entrepreneurship due to unemployment. So the government says we need it because we have people couldn't find a job. But actually people doing it because they really love it, not because they couldn't get a job. Um, and many of them are from families that already engage in business. And where are these activities? So mostly are concentrated in the Poor River Delta and the Yangtze River Delta, a little bit in the central China areas. Uh, mostly basic services like communication information or production services like logistics, etc. Some in education, retail, and construction. Um, and the business scale, most of them are very small, less than five people. Uh, and uh, only 23% reported making a profit. Most of them are losing money or thinking about uh, stop the business. And there's only 20% of survival rate by the end of this year. 
Um, and when asked about their view about entrepreneurship education, most of them are not happy. Either they did not hear about it, or they were not happy. Uh, so only 12% of them say, ah, oh, yeah, it's pretty good, at least what they got. Uh, in general, um, the more entrepreneurship education they got, the more likely they're going to start a business and start a good business. But there are some counterintuitive findings. For example, uh, one survey found the more they learned about the details of entrepreneurship, like the financing, the funding, the networking, the hard stuff, the less likely they're actually going to start it. So we can see <laughs> some students, they started with idealistic view about entrepreneurship, but they don't really know what it's about. Another interesting is the higher the tier of university, say if it's a research university where the government pumping a lot of active money, actually uh, what they got is, is less than satisfactory. Because these students, they usually have a much better uh, chance to get a good job. Lots of them go abroad, some of them go to graduate school. So that's kind of interesting, right? Um, and the overall extracurriculum, according to one study, has more impact than entrepreneurship education alone. So, uh, for example, if you participate in a student club, uh, the kind of skills you will get from this kind of activity is very similar, according to the author, uh, than if you're contributing like, uh, to uh, participating in entrepreneurship education. So, um, that's also very interesting, uh, kind of like rethinking about the curriculum. And they're much less female entrepreneurs. Uh, lastly, I know I'm running out of time, uh, the government have very little funding, only less than 2%, and there's also very little funding from the commercial lending. So the overall policy is encouraging, but down to the detail of policy, um, it's a question. And that's why many students, they started, but they didn't really uh, last that long time. Uh, there's also pretty poor entrepreneurship education uh, perceived by these graduates. And that, according to students, is related to what they have to do. I have to stop here, <laughs> but I, um, one question I do want to raise is we have uh, reviewed entrepreneurship education, but it's mostly related to commercial goals, economic goals, right? Uh, but how about social entrepreneurship? That's something, um, but, well, if this has been raised by the government to solve the unemployment crisis, how about social entrepreneurship as a way to deal with the, you know, the pressing social crisis that we have to face today, especially when civil society is a term that always kind of like a taboo, and a lot of things you cannot really do. So social country, uh, entrepreneurship is kind of a way to go around all this. So I welcome discussion in the last few minutes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite commentary, um, particularly from Professor uh, Yasheng Huang, who's International Program Professor in Chinese Economy and Business, Professor of Global Economics and Management, and Associate Dean for International Programs and Action Learning at MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, I also want to uh, alert you that uh, Professor Huang will be giving uh, this uh, year's forum uh, keynote address, which he'll be delivering on Friday uh, this week uh, at this time, or uh, the time we started at any rate. And uh, uh, Professor Huang, uh, a few comments uh, about our panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Don. Listening to the four presentations made me realize that uh, my life at MIT was incredibly boring. <laughs> <laughs> we usually have very narrow views of entrepreneurship and economic development, you know, business plan, financing plan, marketing plan. And today's presenters really give us a very broad and long historical perspective of uh, entrepreneurship and economic development. I, I, I enjoy the presentation tremendously. And let me just react to the presentations by maybe coming up with uh, a few themes that run through some of these presentations and maybe try to construct the linkages among the, the presentations. 
I was fascinated by Sarah's presentation about uh, Li Yu, and there is a foreshadow of the notion that uh, property rights need to be respected, and uh, copyrights need to be respected. And he was warning other people not to replicate his uh, creative uh, uh, art and his, his work. Uh, so, so the awareness was, was there in China, in ancient China, uh, China. Then the issue is, uh, why is it that property rights, especially intellectual property rights, the idea, those ideas emerged in the West uh, rather than in China, even though there was the awareness of it back in China. And I think one explanation is that and as illustrated by Sarah's presentation, he himself had to warn against others of the dangers and the risks of uh, invading his uh, property rights. But in reality, I don't think he could do anything about it. Right? So the enforcement has to be carried out by an authority that is higher than an individual. And my own view is that that was missing in China. Uh, the property rights have to be enforced by a government that has jurisdiction and the power of violence over all the citizens of the society. The private solution by one individual writer, by one individual creator, is not sufficient uh, and enough. So the awareness was there uh, by the implementation and the enforcement Mines have been missing. At the time of uh, Li Yu in the West, there was beginning of emergence of the notions of patents, for example, legal cases going after each other about uh, copyrights, plagiarism. There's a great book uh, called The Greatest uh, Invention in History. It is about the, the evolution of patents in England, a little bit after Li Yu's time, but roughly uh, around the same uh, historical period. Uh, Daniel's uh, presentation, first of all, let me say that I used to read Jin Ping Mei, uh, and I wouldn't tell people that I like the book. <laughs> <laughs> the book is about sex, <laughs> let's put it that way. Now I can read it, because uh, I can say the book is about entrepreneurship. <laughs> In case uh, my colleagues uh, criticize me, I'm going to invoke the authority <laughs> and uh, to defend my uh, interest in the, in, the, in the novel. And so, but I'm going to reread the book. Uh, I read it when I was 16, so, uh, uh, so I had a different agenda then. So. <laughs> I'm going to reread it and, uh, and with, a, with, a, with a fresh uh, perspective on, uh, on the issues. This idea of converting things that don't necessarily appear to have value into things that have value, uh, shit that you were talking about, uh, that's actually remarkable, right? So value creation and the ability to identify uh, things that are of value, uh, that ability is actually quite uh, rare. Uh, not many people have that. So this, whatever individual it was, who was able to do that, and apparently he became rich, um, that, that's, uh, that's really remarkable. Um, I, I also think that it tells a background story about the state of agricultural development in China. Uh, essentially, agriculture is the downstream industry of a toilet industry. Right? So if you think about the supply chain, the, the toilet industry is here, the agriculture is here, the agriculture is the, is the demand side of the uh, equation, the toilet is the supply side of the equation. <laughs> and uh, so it must mean that the agriculture was developing at a sufficient scale 
uh, to uh, to actually create value, right? and so that's 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 really really uh, the important uh, way of reading history at the time that uh, this uh, transaction uh, happened. So really really interesting. So I I'm, I'm very so you gave me two ideas. One is about thinking like. And which I'm most happy about, and the other one uh, about uh, uh, value creation uh, that that was uh, demonstrated by by this uh, activity. Uh, Rob's uh, fascinating pictures and presentation about uh, insects and, and all of that. And, and uh, actually, let me go back to Daniel's uh, example of fan, right? So the, in the uh, moment. And so he portrayed the episode as a story about scarcity. Right? So that's, you have scarcity, you, re, you resolve scarcity in two ways. One is through economic transaction. I pay a higher price to resolve the scarcity, or I resolve it by fighting. Right? I just eliminate my competitor. And in this case, apparently, fight, fighting was the solution. So that was a story of uh, scarcity. What Rob told us is a story of surplus. <laughs> I mean, insects and insects and all these things, um, and uh, all the same price, right? Uh, everywhere you go, it's the same price. And that's a sign of an industry that is known as a perfectly competitive industry. <laughs> and same price, nobody is really making a profit. And uh, nobody can afford to get in, nobody can afford to get out. And that's basically uh, a characteristic of Chinese economy today in many sectors of, of the economy. If you look at the steel industry, it's the same picture. Uh, China, uh, the capacity of uh, steel production in China is about 1.2 billion uh, tons for crude steel. Uh, they are producing about 700 million. So the, it's way over capacity. Right. Industry after industry is way over capacity. Uh, so that resonates with, with, with what we know about Chinese economy today. The other thing that, that resonates uh, with, with uh, our understanding of Chinese economy is that, Rob, you talk about religion. Religion in China today is money. Uh, and, and nothing more, nothing less. Um, and so it's very interesting that people Burn the, uh, burn the burn the burn these things, and so that's an economic transaction. They have to purchase these things and they burn them. When they burn them, they are praying to to be richer, uh, to become richer. Right. So almost everything is about economics and business, uh, and we can have a debate whether or not this is a sign of a good society when. All there is is economics rather than religion, rather than great ideas, and, and all these other things. Um, so, so two things: one is a surplus uh, economy, and the other is that I think the two things can be related in the sense that when the only religion you have is about making money, pretty much you get a surplus economy, uh, you get oversupply. So, Jing Jing's uh, presentation, to some extent. To some extent, it is about trying to move away from this surplus economy by creating entrepreneurship, by creating, by educating entrepreneurs about innovations and technology. Uh, I'm familiar with Tsinghua University. We have a program with them, and, and, and MIT has pioneered many of these things that they now adopted by uh, Tsinghua University. Uh, the thing is, uh, when the entrepreneurship piece is 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 about economic side of the uh, uh, business, the other side is technology and science. And if you just have the business side, the entrepreneurship, without the technology and the science uh, side, you usually you go back to this competitive industry dynamics that are all. Uh, laid out, and so I, I think Chinese are extremely entrepreneurial. Uh, you actually don't have to educate Chinese to be more entrepreneurial than the Chinese are already are entrepreneurial. The Chinese are the masters of entrepreneurship, but to combine entrepreneurship with science and technology requires something else. 
It requires, I would argue, uh, intellectual property right, requires respect for rule of law, requires respect for academic freedom. So instead of, you know, I, I, I think doing these things is, is good and, and all of that, I'm not just sure whether or not doing these things is, is sufficient. Maybe it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. I think the bigger push toward technology-based entrepreneurship ought to come from creating more freedom, creating more tolerance in the society, and uh, creating rule of law. Those are the things that the government can do. I would argue that the government should spend more of its resources thinking about those things rather than funding and organizing these sort of micro-managerial mechanisms of entrepreneurship. Thank you very much. Still there? Yes, I am. Do you have anything you wanna you wanna add? Yes, uh, a couple of comments. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, as uh, Warren noticed, uh, the backdrop of my video today is actually my bathroom, <laughs> and you can see my shower. Show. But uh, given the fun text of the earlier speakers, I now feel a lot more at home. <laughs> Well, uh, it's also fun to, to, to have just heard from um, Professor Huang about his in, a very interesting tapestry of integrating some of the speakers and talking about Jinping Huang, a uh, Jinping Mei. <laughs> fun fashion time for teenagers. Um, I was a teenage boy and uh, most of my Chinese language studies had to rely on me studying all kinds of novels, mostly classics, and of course includes Jin Ping Mei and uh, Hong Long Meng. And uh, actually I met somebody who recently told me that she studied the Jin Ping Mei primarily for clues of medical practices, medicines, etc. So, Professor Huang, you are not alone in learning something new today. Um, to more seriously, I have two quick comments. Uh, one is that, uh, as has been covered amply just now, uh, entrepreneurship has a long history in China, in my opinion, and everybody notices it today. And maybe the best way to summarize it is Ming Yi Shi Wei Tian like getting fed, getting a full stomach is the highest priority, like heaven. Um, and, and that's the reason why I think the uh, vibrancy of the uh, Chinese capitalism the last 30 odd years has been so impressive. Um, then my second comment is about competition, which again was touched on um, already by uh, Professor Huang as well. Uh, I arrived in Taiwan um, for Citibank in 1992 and has been here as a, as a long-staying, overstaying expatriate. Uh, the biggest thing I learned after having operated for Citibank in five or six other countries was that Taiwan banking was the most competitive uh, marketplace I've ever been. And quickly I realized that price competition was the reason why. And the same thing is happening today where excessive competition is already um, very much a norm in China, especially in the private entrepreneurial sector. State-owned economies or state-owned corporations have its own rules and therefore uh, is relatively less intense. And the biggest challenge therefore in China is to continue to evolve away from price competition and get into more and more innovation and productivity increases. And I think that is coming as well. So that's all I have to say tonight. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that much said, are there any questions for any of our panelists from uh, our lovely audience? Thank you for coming out. It's been wonderful. They love questions. <laughs>
Up here, sir. Uh, I guess mine's for Daniel about the gentleman who turned waste into wealth. Uh, uh, Daniel used a lot of English words and a lot of Chinese words. I'm interested in the words elder mu. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 are, are both of those Chinese words, are, is one English and one Chinese? Uh, uh, and they, and they in Chinese is mu tai gong. Uh, so tai gong just means like grandpa or older man, right? A, a respectful yeah. term, and mu is his na name. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not, his, it's not a relation, Bob. <laughs> Oh, 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 granddad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, uh, Joe. Yeah, I wonder about the definition of entrepreneurship. Uh, as uh, Professor Hong talked about, the state-owned enterprises are favored by the state. They get more loans from state-owned banks. They crowd out money to private enterprises. But there are a lot of entrepreneurs in China working with the state-owned industry and state-favored industry by using their guanxi, their connections. To people to top. We might think that's dishonest, it's not pure business, but on the other hand, it's very entrepreneurial, isn't it? To take advantage of their advantages, which is their relationship to, sometimes familiar relationship to uh, party leaders, and using those to just uh, rise in business or get hired by businesses who think that they'll have some more influence with the regime. Isn't that being entrepreneurial? Exploiting one's guanxi. Right. Uh, any of our panelists care to respond? Is it entrepreneurial to um, exploit your connections? I keep thinking about the issue of risk that, that I read about when we thought about it from the beginning with us something more in sent us. And I, that's, that's what I would just add. I'll just throw it back and just say, where does risk, where does risk fit? Because that's, I think it was one of the early pieces that we, that we all read. Uh, you know, maybe that, a, a key component of uh, at least one definition well, of entrepreneurship. Well, now there's been a crackdown of corruption. Yeah. If you're related to Xi Jinping yeah, as a yeah. leader, maybe there's less risk. But what if you are associated with a lesser Politburo member who may or may not fall with his faction? Um, and, and all they want you can be turned into charges of corruption. I don't know if that you know, answers that. That's it. That's it. Uh, there's no question that this entrepreneur who uses this political strategy is a smart entrepreneur in that environment. Politics matters a lot. Political connections have a lot of value. There's a lot of study showing the value of uh, political connections. And the and private entrepreneurs have a hard time getting loans from the banking system. So the way they do it is they bribe the state-owned enterprises State-owned enterprises basically have an open credit line to the financial system. The money goes to them, they don't really use the money. They own land to the private entrepreneurs, and then the private entrepreneurs deploy the money <clears throat> to do whatever they, they do. That arrangement is okay when the GDP growth is double digit year after year. The problem now is that when the GDP growth slows down, who actually owns that contract becomes extremely unclear, right? And so, so is it a state-owned enterprises that have this debt obligation to the banking system, or the end user, which is the private entrepreneur, who actually should pay back to the banking system? And because the whole arrangement is done under the table, you can't go to the court, right? So it's, there's, a, there's a contradiction there. You can't go to the court to sue the other guy for not paying the loan because you're not supposed to unlend to the person in the first place. To go to the court basically means, I'm telling you, I violated the law, and uh, so put me in jail first and then deal with him, right? So, so increasingly you see the beginning of the vulnerabilities of these arrangements when the debt titles are not very, very clear and in uh, Guangdong province now, a lot of entrepreneurs just pack up and leave. Uh, their factories are empty and, and pack up because they don't want to pay back to the banking system. And the state-owned enterprises have no way of knowing where they have gone. Uh, have gone. So the political uh, uh, convenience worked up to, up to a point. Uh, and it worked in the past. And also with a, with a crackdown on corruption, increasingly you need to think about which political connection actually has value 
which one has risks, right? That calculation is, is more and more important to do than, say, uh, before. Let, let me also, uh, when I asked our panelists to uh, prepare for this uh, panel presentation, well, let me give you the uh, definition of entrepreneurship I provided them with. So the definition that they each had was entrepreneurship, self-employment through business ownership, which has significant elements of risk, control, and reward. So each of the panelists, uh, that was their starting place. Thanks, Warren. Yeah. Uh, I believe you were first, and then over here. Um, this is a question regarding um, Professor Huang's commentary on the entrepreneurship education that you talked about. Um, Chinese entrepreneurs are spiritually or naturally um, having the ha naturally to be entrepreneur, but uh, what we lack is the combination of the science. Um, so, and you say the lack of the science because of the um, economic freedom and the uh, some other things like property rights, which I think the West, let's say, just U.S. did a better job. Um, so a great example, I think, entrepreneurship combining with uh, science is the Silicon Valley. So I was wondering, like, to what extent do you think this would be a good example that China can learn from, and uh, how this model can be copied or replicated to China in terms of in encouraging the entrepreneurship to combine with science? So. Uh, the Silicon Valley is, I believe, is a good model, and obviously uh, China has to think about the cultural adaptations of that model. But I was talking more about university as a source of both knowledge and uh, entrepreneurship. Right? So think about uh, Silicon Valley, Stanford. Mm -hmm. In studies of entrepreneurship in the United States, entrepreneurship tends to cluster that tends to be clustered around universities. Stanford in the West Coast, MIT, not Harvard, uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the East Coast. And so, uh, so the, the university as a supplier of both knowledge and entrepreneurship. So Silicon Valley has, has other connotations. That's one of them. The other is venture capital financing and things like that, and scaling the entrepreneurship. But I think the most important thing is how a university is organized in such a way that it can both innovate and invent, as well as uh, uh, incubate uh, businesses and value creation. Think about the contradictions between university as a producer of knowledge and university of, uh, as a producer of businesses. When we talk about production of knowledge, we value freedom. We value uh, free exchange of ideas. We value uh, free information uh, exchange without costs and prices, right? We shouldn't charge you to give a seminar and things like that, right? So freedom is the, uh, the absolute uh, uh, value. A business is, is, is what? Uh, when you form a business uh, uh, partnership, you ask your partners to sign NDA, non-disclosure agreement. It's about secrecy. It's about making money. It's about doing those things. How a university should try to balance between the freedom that is required to do innovation and the secrecy and non-disclosure aspects of entrepreneurship, that balance is actually extremely hard to do. Uh, Chinese universities, we have done studies of Chinese universities. Chinese universities tend to either just do research or just do entrepreneurship. It's very hard for them to do both. I think there are lots of good examples. MIT is one of them, but Stanford and others, there are lots of good examples from the United States that I think China can learn. But one of the things they, they have to think about is the political control of the universities. So there's a strong political control of the universities in China. We don't have a similar uh, thing in this country. Can I add to that? Yeah, I want to quickly add to that, because um, 
On the slides, talk about the uh, entrepreneurial attitude or tendency for students to actually do it. I agree with Professor Huang that we can, we can see Chinese people are naturally entrepreneurial. There's a lot of going in the history. But coming down to the details how to do six, students still need to this kind of information. And that is why this kind of thing is still valuable. Um, so uh, if you look at the students from business management, they do have they do score highest in terms of like uh, entrepreneurial intention or attitude in general. But then look at students from engineering, they actually score the lowest. So we see the disconnection, and they they have something, but they don't have both in, in either uh, party. Um, and to looking at the faculty um, teaching these courses, actually most of them uh, having scholarly background, but they don't really have experience. And then we have adjunct professor, adjunct faculty coming from the real world, the real field. They have the experience, but there's lack of coordination between what is going on in the university and what they are going to tell the students. So we can definitely see there's a, a disconnect, as Professor Huang already pointed out. And uh, so how this is going and what direction it's pointing to, hopefully we see some positive change. Uh, Eddie Tan, class of uh, 1984. Uh, I'm actually on the Thursday panel talking about uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, I just want to give a couple of comments because myself has been involved with uh, running business, my own business for the uh, last five years. So actually in China, there, is, there are some things that's very different from the United States. One of the things is that if you are a young person that graduated from university, your parents, your relative, what they want you to do is find a stable job. Working for a foreign company that making a lot of money, stable. A domestic company is probably number two choice. And running your own business is probably not recommended by your parents. Okay, that's, that's number one. Number two, I agree with Professor Huang, is that not everyone, uh, the Chinese are actually very good uh, entrepreneurs. If you look at the Ma Malaysia, the Malaysian economy is basically uh, controlled by the Chinese origin population. Chinese are very good at running, doing business. But when, when we talk about entrepreneurship here, we're not just talking about running business. We're talking about running business maybe with additional part of innovation. Innovation is the key word here. Because in, today, if you're just running a traditional bit, uh, uh, business, for example, without the, the internet kind of the information flows, you're probably going to run out of business pretty soon. The traditional business will eventually die. And so you have to start with new thinkings, innovations. But the innovation part in China, Chinese education, is not very strong. It's not very strong when, when the upbringing of a child and also the education in, in, in the school, in the education system. So I used to teach, uh, when I was working in Intel, I used to teach the education, uh, sorry, the Innovation 101 class. So we have so-called Intel University. And so the many things that can be done with different ways or innovative ways. So I think that innovation is the key in the teaching of a university for entrepreneurship. So you can't just tell kids, okay, go run your own business. But if you don't have a new thinking, a new way of doing business, that's going to fail. And the last part of, uh, is that the uh, early stage funding in China is really not good. Uh, so when I run my business, I'm getting a lot of government funds for, for uh, to, to help companies survive in the early stage. Uh, in the US, uh, my first job was a startup in Boston. Uh, it eventually gets sold, but products still, still sell. Uh, but the, 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 the owner was a, was a professor, and he was starting the business with SDIR companies. Uh, eventually getting a, a stage two SDIR, I think $500,000 from, from NASA. So it's, it's a little bit similar, but in the US, the early stage fundings for the venture capitals are very structured, very well established, not in China. So, Thank you, Eddie. Uh, I might add also that our next panel is on uh, Thursday. And Eddie will be taking part, and also it will be moderated by uh, Phi Boon Khan, who uh, was our second commentator that, uh, this evening. Uh, other questions? Um, so actually, uh, from our reading from Professor Huang, so I remember there is a great example about the Long Electronic Company. It's, in, it's kind of first a generation of China's successful company in the private sector, and their products like refrigerators they can compete with like um, German products or American products. 
but because of this kind of confusion of um, um, ownership in that company, they, read, they don't have a legal registration system to register as a private, set, um, private business at that time. So I read more like, news about the company. In 1990s, this founder of the company, he was forced to resign from his position. I feel really bad, and because they, do, they did really well in the past, but because of this kind of confusion in the registration system, and I think in nowadays China's government they want to eradicate, um, eliminate the um, the corruption, but it actually it it causes a lot of problems. A lot of China's entrepreneurs they're facing problems. It's like the in, in the winter of China's economy, and there are so many entrepreneurs who said like in Guangdong they just don't pay the loan, they just don't. But those those money, those deposits, they're they're China's people's deposits. So, and also refer to the uh, 2015 China stock market crash. It's also a China government lag. It's a, I, I won't say it's like a, it's it's a it's a, just a lie. It's a liar. So, and I I I read your article about China's government they should really um, focus on the inside like kind, kind of structure innovation of like some uh, some industries they should give some power, but. I don't really know, like Chinese government, how can they, like which step they can take to, to do that, what they can, do. and also for our Chinese students, I think most of us, we have like family business back to China. So what what advice you can give to us when we go back to China? <laughs> well, you don't have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> And so you asked uh, a excellent question, and also coming from a young student like you, uh, it's very important. The reason why I say that is that for many years, young Chinese don't care about politics. They think that uh, Chinese economy is doing very well. You don't really need the Western legal system and, and all of that. Uh, I think we're beginning to see young Chinese asking questions such as the one you asked. The reason is that there's a, a huge difference. So I always say this, there's a huge difference between GDP growing at 10% and GDP growing at 4 and 5%. There's a huge difference. Basically, when GDP is growing at 10%, you do whatever, whatever will work. And at 5%, at 4%, by Chinese standard, this is low performance. 4%, 5%, you really need to think very carefully about who owns what assets. The titles are important. And is it straightforward private company? <coughs> debt obligations, the contractual obligations, are they clear and straightforward? Is there going to be an independent uh, 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 adjudication of the disputes between the two parties, the, who owns the, uh, the, 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 the factories, the ideas, an earlier question about the, the, the financing, right? All these things are going to matter much, much more than before. And these are basically political questions. It has to do with whether or not a political system is able, willing really, to organize itself in one way vis-a-vis -vis the others and to basically have a system that respects property rights and rule of law. The Communist Party has to give up some of its control. I just don't see any other way out. And that's a political decision. It's not an economic decision. It's not a social decision. It's a political decision. From whatever evidence that I see, uh, the current leadership is centralizing power rather than decentralizing power. So we really need to ask the question, when the GDP is trending down, when it is exactly at the time we need clarity about property rights and all these things, whether or not it is the right thing to do to have the political system to move in the centralized direction rather than decentralized direction. My view is that's not the right direction, but maybe there are other people who argue that it is the right uh, direction. But from 
evidence that we have about other countries, and also from China itself, uh, China has been doing well in part because of political, some of the political reforms and, uh, and some clarification of rights and property. So I hope that, uh, I hope I'm wrong. You know, I, I, you know, I, I'm Chinese, I, I, I hope for the best for, for my country. And I have relatives in China, I don't want economic financial disaster in China. But as you pointed out, the stock market crash this year came very close. Um, and, and it is really, this is a long discussion, but one thing I want to say is that this is the, for the first time that the stock market performance begins to matter for the real economy in the following sense. In the past, the stock market was disconnected from the real economy. This time it is connected through the practice of margin trades, where you can borrow from the bank banks to buy shares. That's going to uh, uh, hurt the, the, the health of the banking system. When the banking system is hurt, you're going to hurt the real economy. We will take one final question for our panelists. Thank you. I just want to ask Professor Wong that I hope you can explain more about how environment discourage for young generations entrepreneurship. Because I saw there can be can be contributed to our problem of resource allocation in China now. Because I think in my opinion, um, the young generation of Chinese now we have less resources because all resources are allocated by the old generation. So we, I want to get a job, I have to use my relation or other stuff, not my own ability. So is this can all concluded by Deng Xiaoping's economic policy because he said we, he encouraged to that part of Chinese people to be richer. So now Chinese people are very they are arguing about whether the Deng Xiaoping's economic policy is good or not. And because now we are facing some economic uh, winter, so we have the GDP loss if the poor people uh, bear a pay for that. So what's your opinion about? Oh, okay. So um, I, I think you, you asked at least two, two questions. One is, what are you going to do yeah, the uh, yeah, so, and then talking economic policy. Is that yeah, so so the economic winter, what are you going to do? What are other young people going to do? And the other is that in the case of economic winter, who is going to shoulder the the cost of economic slowdown? If I understand Yeah, I, 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 I want to focus on whether the resource allocation in China now yeah. is a good environment in encourage our young generation to oh, okay. start business. And is yeah. and I can just say the reason that's why we have this um equal resource allocation is because of the developing economic policy. Uh, well uh I think the Deng Xiaoping's economic policy, I mean, he did say that the, uh, uh, some people get rich first, but he quickly added that's going to lead to the general prosperity. And so you can think of a, a trickle down theory that. They have already conquered the market, conquered the resources. Okay, okay. Uh, but but I, I think there's nothing wrong with having some people getting rich first. The issue is the transmission mechanism, whether or not the wealth accumulated by a few people has broader impact on the rest of the society. If you look at this country, you know, one of the things that's fundamentally wrong with this country is that the, the few uh, rich people capture all the gains, and maybe there's a technological reason for that, but the government has failed to redistribute the income in a way that will benefit the broader segment of the society. So we can have a discussion about this country as well, and we can criticize the United <laughs> States too. Right? And sometimes when I go to China, and, and then they say, uh, oh, how come you don't criticize the United States? I said, I criticize the United States all the time, and that's what we do at faculty lunches. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, and look at the salad, it tastes terrible. There's something wrong with the U.S. government. <laughs>
so about uh, the young people, uh, the, 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 I think, on the other hand, I, I want to echo what Amy said. Uh, we don't want to be too pessimistic. I mean, the, the young people today, uh, Eddie and I came to the United States about the same time. I told uh, some of your classmates uh, during the day, there's no way I could get into a good college in the United States today. The reason is that you're much smarter than I was when I was your age. So you have the IQ going for you, so which is good. It's actually called flame effect. Generations and generations, there's IQ improvement. So that's good. You have the smartness. And, and the other thing is that China is sufficiently open. Yes, China doesn't have the venture uh, funding industry. But foreign venture firms are very active in China. You can access that capital. Technology, uh, Chinese are not just entrepreneurial. They are also tech savvy as well. The use of internet in China is tremendous. Uh, and uh, the WeChat that we all use, uh, it's much better than text messaging uh, app uh, here. Right? So there are lots of things that, that, that young people in China are, are, are doing right. And they have the opportunities that I didn't have when I was your age. Uh, so all these macroeconomic discussions sometimes sound very, very depressing, but on the other hand, I believe that there are still many, many opportunities. So even if the economy is growing at 3 or 4%, uh, think about the unfulfilled demands uh, of the new Chinese economy. The things that are going to be disappearing are the ready business opportunities for state-owned enterprises. You're not going to build another 3,000 airports uh, anymore. You're not going to build another 3,000 uh, high-speed railway tracks anymore. Right? So these are the things that state-owned enterprises are good at. But with 3% growth, 4% growth, we're talking about an economy, $14 trillion. You know, 3% of that, 4% of that, that still creates lots of opportunity. So I don't want to be unduly pessimistic. But the question about who is going to bear the burdens of the economic adjustment, that I do worry. I do believe that the rural Chinese, migrant workers, the poorer Chinese, are going to bear the disproportionately the burdens of economic slowdown. Right? It is not going to be the educated young Chinese elite. They have opportunities. I worry about the rural kids. I worry about the, the young people who used to work in the textile factory, now the factory has been moved to Vietnam. What is he or she going to do? And now we're going to have another wave of technological revolution, robot technology. Uh, robotic technology is going to replace some of these manual labor positions. I really worry more about those, and, uh, and I worry about the political implications of having so many young, less skilled uh, rural migrant workers being dislodged from, from, from economic development. So I think as, as responsible citizens, we need to think more about that. Uh, because I think you're fine. You're doing fine. You go to a very good college. You're smart. You are connected globally. You know people. I think you're OK. But it is those people. And the political demands, political instability as a result of those people losing out, that I worry about. With that much said, uh, I hope everyone agrees that this eighth Upton Forum is off to a great start. Please continue to participate. Thank you for your participation.